Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. How are you doing this morning? All right. How many uh, people here have skied before? Yeah, it's a handful, a little bit. So when you're skiing, what's the one thing that always happens? Exactly, you fall. When you ski, you fall. And not just when you're learning, either. Falling is just part of skiing, right? Maybe that's why it's harder for adults to learn than for kids. Um, adults maybe are more self-conscious about falling, maybe about looking good. But if you never fall when you're skiing, you're not challenging yourself. And I'm not talking about falling and getting hurt. Usually falling on snow doesn't, doesn't hurt. So since falling is part of skiing, an important part of learning to ski is learning to get back up. Right? Just makes sense. You get to practice that a lot. And if you ski a lot, you fall a lot, you get better at falling, and you get better at getting back up. I used to ski a lot. And I like to tell people that I was an expert at getting up. <laughs> to stand back up after you've fallen skiing, what's the first thing you have to do? You've got to put your skis in the right position. Because if they're, if they're not right straight across the hill, as soon as you stand up, zoom, you're gone. You take off, whether it's forward or backward, whether you're ready or not. And if you're lying on the ground with your skis above you on the hill, you're probably going to keep sliding downhill head first. And that's not skiing. <laughs> you not be able to stand up at all. So, and also, I want to point out that everything I've said about skiing is equally true for snowboarding. Okay, falling and getting up are just part of both sports. Another part of skiing is riding the chairlift. I think I got pictures back here. If, even if you haven't skied before, you've probably seen this on TV. Here's a couple of pictures. I just have a couple there. So um, that there's not much to do while you're riding the chairlift up the mountain except watch the skiers below you. And there's scenery too. That's, that's also good to look at. So I'm going to tell you a story about Bob. Bob was a skier. He'd been skiing since he was 8 years old for 10 or 11 years. He was a good skier. He could ski any run on the mountain, from beginner runs to advanced and expert runs. Bob enjoyed skiing. He wasn't much good at other sports, so he often liked to show off his skiing skills. And what better way to do that than to ski directly under the chairlift, where everyone could see him. So one of the runs that ran right under the chair was called K2 Face named after the second highest and most dangerous mountain in the world. The run was not only steep, but narrow as well, making it an experts only run. Bob had skied on this run numerous times and liked to hear the positive comments and sounds of awe from the skiers above him on the chairlift. One day as he stood at the top of the steepest part looking down, he even said out loud, just watch this everyone. On his very first turn, his ski caught an edge, and Bob found himself hurtling head first down the precipice with no way to stop. People on the chairlift above him were yelling and screaming, afraid that he wouldn't be able to stop until he hit a tree or one of the enormous chairlift posts. Bob knew not to panic, and as he began to pick up speed, he saw something he hadn't noticed before. A very small tree, maybe just part of a branch, sticking out of the snow below him. He lunged for it and grabbed it, and it stopped him. He was able to turn around and get his skis beneath him so he could stand up. He'd lost his hat in the fall and so spent a few minutes looking for it and digging it out of the snow. Meanwhile, all the people on the chairlift going over his head were talking to him, saying things like, I saw you fall, and I thought you were going to die. Not the compliments Bob had been looking for. In fact, the comments continued for what seemed like forever as Bob had to ski out the rest of the run beneath the chairlift. Apparently, nearly everyone on the lift had seen him fall. 
It's hard to think of a more literal example of Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh, and by the way, I have to make a confession. The skier's name wasn't Bob. It was me. <laughs> 40 years ago. So please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12, verse 20. So I want to do a brief review of what's been happening in Acts. Back in the beginning of this chapter, we saw that Herod the king had arrested some of the church leaders. He'd executed the apostle James, John's brother, and he had arrested Peter, intending to have him put to death as well. But the church was praying fervently for Peter. God sent an angel to miraculously free Peter from prison. So Peter interrupted their prayer meeting, much to their astonishment. But Herod blamed the guards for Peter's escape and had them executed instead. Then Herod went down to Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So verse 20. Now he, Herod, was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were cities further up the coast. They weren't really part of Herod's kingdom, but the people there were pretty rich from doing lots of trade. Right? It's a major port. So verse 20 again. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. So it's a little obscure, but what it's saying is that these guys from Tyre and Sidon knew how to play politics. They came down and convinced a cabinet insider to help them. The reason they were worried about the king's anger is that all their food, except maybe fish, was grown in Herod's kingdom, and they knew he would cut them off if he stayed angry with them. So verse 21, on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. So Herod got dressed up and sat on his throne and gave them a speech. It sounds pretty st standard stuff, right? But the, the Jewish historian Josephus, who, by the way, wasn't a Christian, wrote about this event also and described Herod's royal apparel as being made with silver woven into the fabric. It shone brightly in the morning sun. It sounds quite dazzling, right? Verse 22, the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. It was like a chant. The voice of a God and not of a man. The voice of a God and not of a man. They knew how to flatter the king to get themselves into his good graces. They knew what he wanted to hear. And Herod just soaked it in. This was the honor and glory he thought he deserved. Verse 23, And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. Only God deserves glory. Not you, not me, not the king. And Herod knew better. That's my first point. God hates arrogant pride. What is arrogant pride really? It's putting myself in God's place, making myself a God. It's just what Herod was doing. It's going in the face of the first of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. And it says, the angel of the Lord struck him. But how? Let's, let's continue on. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. You. I started reading about this medical condition that Dr. Luke is describing, and I had to stop. It's too nasty. It's a kind of death that's frequently attributed to extremely evil people. It's a terrible way to go. Herod was 54 and had only been king for a few years. This whole episode reminds me of Proverbs 11, verse 8. The righteous is delivered from trouble, but the wicked takes his place. God delivered Peter from death, but Herod took his place. It also reminds me of another arrogant king, although that story has a different ending. So I'm going to read a sizable passage from Daniel 4, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation because it's, it's a smoother, uh, it makes a smoother 
read when you read it as a narrative like this. So this all took, going back to Daniel, this all took place in Babylon about 600 B.C., about 30 years after the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace incident. So Daniel 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. His name, he was named Belteshazzar after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. In parentheses. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magi magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Sounds pretty good so far, right? Then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. The messenger shouted, Cut down the tree and lop off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump and roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field. For seven periods of time, let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the holy ones so that everyone may know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses, even to the lowliest of people. Belteshazzar, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. But you can tell me, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. Then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belteshazzar replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. The tree you saw was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. That tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to heaven and your rule to the ends of the earth. Then you saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and the roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and surrounded by tender grass. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals of the field for seven periods of time. This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen to my lord the king. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. You will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. 
You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That same hour the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. After this time passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal, and all the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, What do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the King of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. My second point, God is supreme over the affairs of men. King Nebuchadnezzar repented of, he turned away from his insolent pride. So the end of his story is much better than that of Herod's. Nebuchadnezzar not only repented, but he praised and worshiped God for who he is. He learned his lesson, although he learned it the hard way. So if you're back in Daniel 4, let's turn back to Acts 20. Herod was dead. Meanwhile, what was happening with the church? Verse 24. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Meanwhile, the church continued its growth, and it was multiplied by God. The church didn't grow itself. God grew it. And to say it was multiplied is to say that it grew exponentially. And we hear this phrase a lot, something grew exponentially. But what does that really mean? So an easy way to think of it is that it means something doubles in size regularly. God was not just adding to people to his church. He was causing, ra- causing it to grow rapidly in the face of serious opposition. So here's a little thought exercise. You know, you know I, like, uh, I like math and numbers. So if I start today and share the gospel with two people, And tomorrow, they each share it with two other people that haven't heard it yet. And the third day, each of those four shares it, and so on. So the number of people sharing doubles each day. How long would it be before everyone on the whole earth heard the gospel? How long would it be? Think, 100 years? No? 10 years? (laughs) One year? Six months? No. 32 days. Wow. <laughs> that is in, check my math. <laughs> You'll see. Amazing, isn't it? Each person only tells two others. Exponential growth is an impressive thing. <laughs> so Luke, the author of Acts, has been giving us these periodic updates on the growth of the church. So I'll go back a little bit. After Peter and the apostles had been thrown in prison... They'd been threatened not to speak in the name of Jesus. Acts, verse, Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many other priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And then a while later, after Saul had become a Christian, and the Jews had been plotting to kill him, but he escaped. Acts nine thirty one. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up. And going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. And after the, after the persecution that happened after Stephen was killed, in Acts eleven twenty one, the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And finally, after James was killed and Peter was almost killed, 
what we just read, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But the Lord of the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. So you see a pattern with these at all? It's not the pattern that we would expect. Persecution happens and the church grows in spite of it or maybe as a result of it. Doesn't that seem backwards? It's a clue that God is causing the growth and not men. That's my third point. God causes His church to grow and spread. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, He uses people to cause His church to grow through prayer and action, but He alone is the cause of the growth. We don't get the credit. He gets the glory. So finally, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Barnabas and Saul returned to Antioch after bringing aid to the help of Christians in Jerusalem. And when they returned, they brought John Mark, who we'll read more about later. That's my last point, though. God moves people around to fulfill his mission. Have you ever wondered why God had Pastor Chuck move to Atlanta? I have. He's a godly man who wants to serve God. So he followed God's leading to move his family down there. The words of of the song that we sing are so appropriate. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. And in the same way, God is preparing a man to come and be our church's new pastor. Our part is to pray for that man and to love each other in the meantime, as well as look for him. Right, Pastor Search Committee? Yeah. (laughs) I challenge you to take at least a minute out of your day each day this week and pray for our next pastor. And while you're at it, pray for the people around you, too. Especially pray that we would have the patience to wait for the man God will bring. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me, when you search for me with all your heart. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.